I mean, is it just like throw something in the fabrication notes and they'll handle the rest? Or is that not the right approach? You can certainly do that. Uh, you know, that They're probably going to come back and complain to you? For sure. I mean, they're going <laughs> to yell at you, actually. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the On Track Podcast. I am Zachariah Peterson, your host for today. Uh, I am speaking today with Juan Frias, uh, who works at a major aerospace OEM. Uh, Juan, I'm very happy to have you on the podcast today, and um, I'm really looking forward to talking about your perspective on design. Um, for those of you who are not aware, Altium Live is coming up soon. We're going to have some links in the show notes that you guys want to look at. And um, some of the stuff that Juan and I are going to talk about today really relates to the overall theme of Altium Live. Uh, so go check out the link in the show notes, sign up. It's going to be all virtual this year, so everybody can attend. Welcome to Altium's On Track podcast, where we talk to leaders about PCB design, tackling subjects ranging from schematic capture all the way to the manufacturing floor. I'm your host, Judy Warner. Please listen in every week and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and all your favorite podcast apps. And be sure to check out the show notes at altium.com forward slash podcast, where you can find great resources and multiple ways to connect with us on social media. Juan, thank you so much for being with us today. Hey, Zach. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's, it's an honor to be here. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it was great to, to see you and talk to you at PCB West. I know when we were down there, uh, it was, I think everybody was kind of uh, uh, letting out some, some energy that had been pent up for a while, seeing as how it hadn't been in person for a couple of years. Oh, yeah, definitely. It was a good time seeing a lot of people, very good friends there. So, yeah, very good time, very good, very good uh, show, too. Yeah, I always like going to the to the trade shows when I can. I mean, I'm I'm so busy. I'm sure you're pretty busy in your job, but I always find the the learning opportunities and the networking opportunities are extremely valuable. Yeah, definitely. About time to do that. <laughs> yeah, about time exactly. So, um, well, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you, and I've I've been talking to a few people in the aerospace sector, especially because. It's uh, becoming, I don't want to say popular, but it's becoming uh, extremely relevant from a design perspective again is because now things like commercial space are taking off, uh, reusable space flight vehicles, um, high reliability design is kind of coming back in center focus. And so, you know, you work at a company that is also a manufacturer and we talk a lot about design with manufacturing, not just design for manufacturing, meaning like really having insight into what has to happen on the factory floor and how your specific manufacturer operates. So I think it'd be really great to get kind of your perspective with working at uh, your your employer and some uh, some insight into kind of how you interface with, with manufacturing, what that looks like on a, maybe on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, definitely. Uh, happy to share this. Um very interesting way is uh, pretty much my first time doing this uh, kind of uh, thing, having the, the chop floor just a few steps a steps away from my desk. It's, uh, you know, very good to know, get to know the people and have a real time conversations uh, with all of them. I mean, the cat, uh, the cam guy sits right next to me, one of them. I mean, there's a few. And then the manufacturing guys for, in the chop floor, they, they're just, I mean, 30 feet away from me, so it's really cool. So we we get to know each other, you know, and little by little, it's kind of easier to work together because we know what the other person is expecting from you, and you you make your their their job easier, and they make your job easier too because there is less issues on the way, you know. So it's really cool uh, compared to working with an external supplier. Uh, well, sometimes uh, it's 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 okay too, as long as you work with the supplier from the beginning. But sometimes there is a miscommunication or something, uh, or you have to wait a couple of hours or something to get a, an answer. So, I mean, there is a very good advantage having the the, the chop floor right next to you. Yeah, that's kind of interesting because I th I think if you work in that environment where, like you say, it sounds like you're almost sharing a cubicle with you know, a cam engineer. Um, right. I, I think, 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think if you work in that environment, you kind of it's easy to take for granted what happens with kind of the how fluid the process can be. Whereas, like if you're doing what I do, where you have a service bureau, you just like you said, you have to wait and you have to go back and forth with people. There's an email chain. I swear the email chains get very long. Sometimes it's hard to track things. And so it, I think it can be easy to take for granted how, how easy it is to, to work with you know, someone who's right there next to you. Yeah, definitely. Because uh, as you mentioned, sometimes, uh, I mean, an email, it, it could be like a 100 email emails there and information can get lost easily. So if you have the guy right next to you and, and you ask him a question, it's like, is it okay to do this or do that? He's gonna tell you on the spot. Okay, go for this. This is what we can do. Okay, yeah, that's what you you do on your design, and then you know, send it out, send it out for for manufacturing. If there are any issues down the road, I mean, you can revise it, and here we go again. So it's a very very fast paced environment there, it's, it's, which is very good, definitely. Yeah, I'm I'm sure if there's you know someone who's kind of transitioning your design into in the tooling or getting ready getting ready for production, like they see something in the Gerbers, they can turn around and say, "Hey Juan, what is this? Who who screwed up?" Yeah, usually me most of the times, <laughs> but you know, the good thing here I didn't is I didn't want to say that, but <laughs> well, well, that's what it is, right? So, so. Yeah, I mean, the good thing here is that, uh, you know, little by little, you you learn from your mistakes, you know, and there's something wrong. I mean, you can correct it on the spot and just revise and send it out. But usually, I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but usually one mistake happens once and doesn't happen again because you already know not to do that, of course. And actually, there is if there is a, not necessarily a mistake, but I will say something you can improve or make it like better for manufacturing, they're gonna tell you, okay, you know what? This will be better if you do it like this. So next time, okay, good. You know, if we can, if there is a chance to change it right there, I mean, let's do it, why not? Uh, but you know, this kind of things is, uh, is back and forth communication, either verbally or, or by email, it depends. But usually it's verbal, it's way, way faster. So, which is good because the products are coming like, a, you know, uh, flawless almost most of the times. Uh, well, there, there is always room for improvement anyway. Yeah, that's really interesting kind of having that instant feedback because like if, you, if you're a service bureau, you send something out and it comes back in terms of like improving the design and even maybe improving design for manufacturability, um, you don't know. You're you're just kind of left to figure it out for yourself during testing. But that, I think that's really interesting and, and something that is uh, also overlooked in terms of its value, which is, you know, getting that feedback instantly from the guy who's actually, you know, running it through production. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it, it goes from, the, you know, from the Gerbers to the fabrication drawing, like, okay, you know what, uh, can can you change this just to make it a little bit more clear for me? Absolutely. I mean, you got it. Uh, anything they need to make their job easier and help me to learn and, you know, have a better process, a better outcome on all your jobs, your designs. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I know with uh, working in defense and aerospace, one of the often uh, quoted types of PCBs that is, you know, brought into this sphere is like flex and rigid flex. So you, you work on a lot of flex and rigid flex. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. I mean, what kinds of designs are you doing uh, with flex and rigid flex? Is it, I think it's something where people kind of assume like the enclosure has to move. And so that's why you would do flex or rigid flex, or maybe there is uh, you're just kind of designing it as like an interface board. Like it's going to connect to two other boards or something like this, like with a board to board connector on each end, you're basically taking advantage of the flex ribbon to, to route signals. And what types of designs are you doing on, on rigid flex without getting too much into IP, of course. Definitely. Yeah. We, yeah. we are doing some, uh, uh, interesting systems that, you know, um, are for communication within, uh, aerospace, uh, industry. 
uh, that's what I can say for now. Um, basically, it depends on the closure where these uh, designs assemblies are going is whether you have the luxury of having a connector or not. I mean, if you have the space for a connector and you can put the ports together, that's great. That's cheaper, actually. Uh, but if you don't, then you have to go for the rigid flex, you know, and to put like a two or three boards interconnected uh, with a flex cable. And that's what you have to do. Uh, it depends again because sometimes you don't you don't have the luxury of using a harness or something like that because of the application so you have to go for the flex uh, I mean the different aspects of course uh, a lot of them are just a connector on a flex I mean two connectors on a flex side by side and interconnecting something a system to the other uh, that kind of thing you know it's uh, between systems is a, a flex with two connectors and stiffeners, that kind of thing. Yeah, so de definitely an easy way to interconnect boards, but you, you brought up space savings, which I think sometimes is, is overlooked in, in rigid flex. I think, you know, I'm I'm a guy, I kind of think of it like, well, you can you know move it and you can bend it, you can twist it, which is really cool. And so that immediately brings up an idea of like, you know, uh, like cameras or something like this, or maybe your laptop screen or something, anything where it has to fold or bend. But I guess with uh, uh, with space savings and being able to do it on a cable versus like taking two rigid boards, putting them together with like an edge connector or something, seems like there could also be a reliability benefit as well. Because now when you have these two you know rigid boards connected together, they start vibrating. Um, I'd imagine there'd be a reliability problem and possibly fatigue failure. I mean, do you see the same kind of thing with with rigid flex, or is rigid flex really chosen because? Um, it might be more reliable in that type of situation where you do a vibration or mechanical shock. Yeah, definitely uh, rigid flex is uh, more stable in that matter. I mean, you have very good connectors from different companies you can use too. But, you know, in, in it seems in the long run, on my experience, that rigid flex could be a best option for this kind of applications. I mean, it depends again on the spacing and restrictions you have. If you have the luxury and it's okay, just go for it. If not, I mean, you can look into the options, but definitely taking care of looking closely to the requirements from the system. Yeah, well, uh, when you say like requirements from the system, I mean, it's un there's going to be a lot to balance in any system, right? Because you have, I, I, you know, with rigid flex, you have multiple orientations you could access, whereas in the past you might have to make the system physically larger just to be able to access that with a bunch of rigid boards connected together with uh, with connectors, like edge connectors, let's say. Yes, and then, definitely. oh yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, sorry, you, you go ahead. Uh, well, and then, I mean, what, what else would influence the choice of going with like a flex versus a rigid flex board? Like what are the different design considerations, I guess? Uh, well, basically, you mean flex versus rigid flex? Again, it depends on the components you are using. I mean, with a rigid flex, you can put pretty much any component you want. Uh, on the flex, you are very limited on components you can use. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, it's because it's flexible, so you don't have the luxury of putting big components or that kind of thing. Of, of thing. Even though you can put a stiffener, you know, that the, the res mechanical restrictions or, or kind of thing with uh, the components being soldered to a flex. It's uh, it's tricky, it becomes tricky later on on the on the test and even on the field. Yeah, so that that's another aspect of, of flex and rigid flex that I think most designers may not be so familiar with because I at least for me, I don't do, you know, flex or rigid flex, not yet at least. Um, we might do like a little bit with the rigid section, but at the end that someone's going to take that and integrate it into like a rigid flex board. Um, but I guess you're talking about soldering directly onto the flex ribbon. I mean, what, what types of considerations go into that? Is that really a manufacturing issue that you just kind of throw it over the fence or do they have to really tell you, Hey, this is how you have to design this on the flex ribbon in order for us to be able to assemble it properly. Yeah, definitely. There are some guidelines there. I mean, to be honest, most of my designs are just a connector. And sometimes there is a very small 
passives like a resistor or something like that, thermistors on the flex. I'm not talking about PGAs or something like that, to be honest. Uh, it's, I'm, it's not my field right now, but it's mainly connectors, uh, you know, end to end from the, on, on the flex cable, let's call it that way. Okay, so I can see one kind of instance where you might want to opt for, you know, a rigid flex versus flex, and you had mentioned like a BGA. Probably can't. Yeah. I've never heard of a BGA being soldered onto, you know, a flex ribbon. So then you would want to put exactly. that on the rigid section. Exactly. And it's probably only small BGAs. I mean, how many signals can you fit through, you know, a flex a flex ribbon? Yeah, I mean, you can put as, uh, I mean, a lot of them maybe it depends on the layers you use. But it becomes tricky again because, uh, you know, the BGA signals are might be high speed and while well, you are adding more restrictions or uh, problems, maybe, in uh, down the road. But that doesn't mean you cannot do it. You, you certainly can, but it's, uh, it's becoming more complex every time. So then at that point, if it's like high speed, you have to, you're basically riding differential pairs over a flex ribbon. Now you have to do controlled impedance. Yes, yes, definitely you can do that. You just need uh, to meet all the requirements for, for that uh, differential pair. Uh, but you can definitely do that with a, with a flex too, you know, putting the numbers there. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, in terms of getting started with a uh, with like a rigid flex design, um, and I know I'm asking all this because like this is still a new area for me and you know, the, the manufacturing process for flex and rigid flex is, you know, it seems so interesting. Um, I mean, what do you, what do you do in terms of material selection? How, how do you select what's available? Who manages that? You know, how, how, what, what role does manufacturing play in that? Well, usually, um, uh, this goes on the marketing team. I mean, they, they talk to the customer and you know, there are some requirements, then it goes to the, uh, what is the name of this, uh, people, uh, this group, you know, like uh, quotations, that kind of thing. And there is engineering involved too. I'm not there, to be honest. There's other people just making making sure experts on material that talk to the customer and come with a, come up with a solution there. And then they just put uh, the requirements there, selections, options, I mean. And then from, from there, once we have a, an order, you know, a, a, the green light to, to move forward, uh, we, of course, we have to, to be sure that we have the material available with us so we can start working on that because you don't want to start working on something and then at the very end realize, oh, we don't have the material. You, we have to wait one or two weeks or maybe more to get the material and get this built, you know. So you usually, you know, lock the material once you, you have a, the order. Lock the material so it's going to be waiting for you one, two weeks. It depends how much how long it takes to get the design ready. So the material is locked, so you you are you have assurance that you're gonna get a board later on. Yeah, that's kind of interesting because you know we talk about shortages and you know checking stocks and managing inventory all the time with components. I've never heard anybody talk about it with materials. And so now you're talking about it with the actual board materials. I, I mean, I, I know that uh, some of my first designs when I sent them in for fabrication. Uh, first of all, I didn't even, I'll be honest, I didn't even specify the material. <laughs> um, just kind of hope that they have something that matches that, that DK value. But then my next round, I did specify the material, but of course they didn't have it. And so I didn't even check it ahead of time. But um, I mean, with you guys being the manufacturer as well as the design team, it sounds like you guys have to, you know, really integrate all your systems to make sure that not only is the material available, it's not already pulled for another order, things, things like this. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's exactly the key, Zach, that you have a, you know, you have an outline, you, you know how, how big the board is. So you can kind of calculate how many, how much material you're going to need. I mean, the sheets of material there. So you can put a lock on, on this and then they are for you because there is an order and everything. So this, uh, that material is for your, your PCB. So it's good. It's good to have that because later on you won't have any issues with uh, material shortages. 
Yeah, so it's not really so much an issue of you guys start a design and then the materials are already available. Like, you know, you guys kind of do all that work on the front end to lock it in, which, I mean, is great. I always tell, uh, you know, people who watch uh, some of the Altium Academy videos, send it off to your fabricator first to make sure they can actually fabricate it. And I think half of the equation in that is make sure they actually have materials that can hit those specs what you guys are yes. already doing on the front end. But I do I do have one question for you. So, I mean, what do you guys do when, you know, you have an existing design and you maybe need to do another board spin later on and you're going to prep the design for fabrication again? What what do you do when any of those materials aren't available? I mean, do you just have to put it in an order and, you know, hope it arrives on schedule? Yeah. Do you guys use the well, slash sheets to find alternatives? In the answer is yes. I mean, we usually have stock of the materials we use all the time. I mean, if there is something that is, uh, you know, we have, we are about to run out of one material or two, we already have a system in place that orders something, so, some more material, you know, right away. I mean, there might be, I haven't seen that. It might happen, I guess, that the material is not available in the short term, meaning one or two months. So we have to look into alternatives and, you know, of course, talk to the customer to get approval if that is the case. I haven't seen that, to be honest, but that doesn't mean it cannot happen. But the good thing is, you know, it's uh, it's good to have more options than, than only one. But we usually have a stock of, the, of material. Uh, if we're running out, we just order more, you know, trying to keep up. Sure, sure. Um, and then... The other thing that has always been uh, a little esoteric to me in terms of what the designer needs to do or know in terms of ensuring manufacturability, and this is, you know, related to materials, is what what do designers need to know about stiffener and what do they have to specify in the design in terms of using stiffener, making sure fabrication knows which materials they need, all, all of this kind of stuff. I mean, is it just like throw something in the fabrication notes and they'll handle the rest or is that not the right approach? You can certainly do that, uh, you know. That They're probably going to come back and complain to you? For sure. I mean, they're going <laughs> to yell at you, actually. But, you know, that's the that's the advantage of having the, the manufacturing people right next to you because they're going to tell you, okay, this is not going to work. Can you change this? Can you change that? Just a, a, a quick example. It's in the past, the stiffeners I've done, the, when you have a two-hole connector, and then you put the stiffener right under that uh, connector. I mean, after the flex, of course. So I used I used to put like uh, the same size drill on the stiffener than the flex. But in this case, they told me they need a bigger hole in order to align because it might get tricky. You know, if one or two holes are misaligned, then that's gonna be a problem. And that's okay, you can make the holes a little bit bigger because at the end it's just a stiffener. You are not soldering anything there, so you should be okay. So, you know, that's one of the best practices we have there is like an increase the hole size a little bit in order to align the stiffener to that two hole connector. Uh, so, I mean, with stiffener, I'm again, this is coming to someone who doesn't do flex. Um, so the stiffener, does, does that get applied bef- before drilling or is this a separate material, it gets drilled, you have to hope that the registration is correct, it's applied after drilling. It's, uh, the stiffener is FR4 usually, Zach. It's, uh, oh, I see, know, okay. Yes, it's, it's just a rigid material, FR4, FR4 is the most common. It's basically, you have a, a specific shape for that uh, stiffener that matches, ideally, the connector size. So you can see that connector there. So you drill the flex, it's a separate uh, board, and then you put some adhesive and, you know, uh, bond the the stiffener with the flex. And then you can can put the connector, of course. I mean, it's it's on, it depends on the, on the application or how the connector is soldered, or you're gonna put the stiffener before or after. Usually it's, uh, it's after. Sure. Okay. Okay. I see. Yeah. So you're, you're fabricating it. You, you said you bond them up with an adhesive and then afterwards you do the assembly. That makes sense. And so it's that internal hole 
uh, in the in the uh, the flex or no in the uh, sorry in the stiffener that has to then be large enough to be able to fit that connector. Yeah, the hole in the stiffener has to be a little bit larger than the one right. in the flex in order to align perfectly. Yeah, I see. I see. And then the soldering happens. You said it doesn't happen on the actual stiffener. You said it's actually happening on the flex ribbon. The, the stiffener is just a FR4 material. There, there is no copper there on the yeah. stiffener. I see. I see. Okay. I'm getting an image in my head of how this all works. Um, yeah. And then, okay. So, and I mean, with adding the stiffener, I'm assuming that's a big reliability constraint. So like if you have to have, you know, connectors like this, maybe it's a press fit connector and it's coming off of the rigid section. Um, you know, that's going to be something more for a high reliability application, maybe something that's going to be involved in a lot of vibration or mechanical shock. I mean, is that kind of the approach for that type of, that type of design? Or is there some other consideration that determines, you know, do we need to have flex versus, you know, versus all, or do we need to have rigid flex versus all flex? Because, I mean, we talked about putting like a BGA there, but, you know, what other, what other stuff might go on the, the rigid section to ensure reliability? Well, ideally, all the components will be better, definitely. The flex, I mean, on the rigid flex, you want the flex to be along because it's going to be bending all over the place, I guess. So, I mean, you have the rigid, I mean, the rigid flex, you want all the components there, definitely. But you, could do, like a per, you could do like a permanent bend in a flex ribbon, couldn't yes. you? Yes, I mean, yeah. it depends where it's gonna be installed, but you can preform that flex, definitely. So it's easier and it's uh, pretty much ready to use, of course. So you don't have to have the hassle. Uh, I think I did that in the past once or twice, but it was uh, basically it was the angle how the flex was designed and built, of course. So that allows the bend to happen without too much of a problem there. So you mean the angle, like the angle along the flex ribbon? So like you're running this direction, angle has to go this way. You kind of basically you basically have to specify in your fab and assembly drawing like this is where the angle sits. This is how far it bends over. Yeah, basically the you know uh, the way you design it is like a you can do like a curve or something that uh, you know makes the bending easier for the the flex itself. So you know doing that on a mechanical usually it's on the mechanical side like where they can define these kind of uh, curves and everything in order to make make it easy for the the PCB designer to you know to design that flex in a way that it will work on the final product. Yeah, so, uh, okay, so, you know, the mechanical guy is actually doing this on the front end and kind of creating those constraints for you. And they're gonna yes. say, this is what our enclosure is gonna look like. This is what your bend's gonna look like. This is where you have room to fit components. And then, you know, you being the physical designer, it's kind of up to you to figure out how you're gonna work within all of that. Yes, definitely. Yeah, so a lot of collaboration involved. Um, I know that's extremely important for uh, modern designs generally and rigid, but uh, it seems like there's all these other, you know, considerations with flex, especially to make sure that it's, you know, manufacturable and uh, you fit into these more, possibly more complicated enclosures that, you know, we don't really see on the rigid side. Yes, definitely. It's a, a lot of, uh, you know, front end, back end work there. Related is not only the PCB design is more people involved than that, but yeah, definitely it's, it's something to keep in mind all the time, working with a whole team to make things right. Hopefully, the first time. So, and and you, are you guys doing just the uh, just the PCBA, or are you doing like the full assembly, you're putting it in the enclosure? You're doing the final bending on like if it is a flex, you're doing any any bends that have to be done, um, all of that installation. Is that are you guys doing that as well? For our products, yes, we do the whole thing. I mean, not the assembly, uh, really. I mean, we have a we have something there, but uh, you know, most complex uh, systems there they're going to a, an outside vendor. But with our products, we do the uh, most of the things, and then with uh, the, we have some products for external customers. We only do you know like the flex with the uh, two connectors, and it goes. To a specific customer there so we can we, we usually do both 
Okay, yeah, so it seems more like a case-by-case -case basis, but, you know, I, I can imagine it's very useful to have all of that feedback if it is all happening in-house and, you know, everyone's able to catch those design mistakes before you spit out a huge batch of boards and they go into that final assembly and all of a sudden they have to be scrapped. Yeah, no, definitely. We usually go for prototypes first, you know, to make sure that it's a good design before we spend a lot of time and money, of course, on that. And then once everything, you know, it's validated, qualified, then we go for production. So, I mean, in terms of, of validation and, and qualification, I mean, what, what level of tests do you have to uh, specify versus what the customer has to specify? I mean, I, I've dealt with customers where they don't really know what it is they need. They just know it needs to do A, B, and C. And so you kind of have to tell them, well, you know, we'll probably need a controlled impedance test or something like this. And you'll have to be able to tell them, you know, you'll want to test this particular structure on the board. Uh, usually when it's an RF design, they'll need to test it. And so we'll produce a test board or something like this. But um, I'm wondering how much, how involved are you as the designer with certain aspects of, of validation and how much do you have to specify versus what the, what the customer has to specify? Or is it manufacturing that specifies some of this stuff? Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. On, as a PCB designer, we usually put, you know, the electrical test, net list, and control impedance lines, if we have any. Other than that, that's, uh, that's, that's our part there. However, manufacturing has other tests they, they, they run. For instance, there is a, well, I'm not going to call it a test. It's an inspection. Basically, they put the real board versus versus the versus the Gerber cut data and compare each other with a, with a, with a machine there to make sure that it was built per print. Of course, they run electrical tests. Of course, they run uh, impedance tests if required. And you know, sometimes I heard this. I haven't seen it. But they they do like a pulling test to make sure that it uh, you know the stiffener is properly bonded to the to the flex, for instance. So you just to make sure that there is there are no issues with this. So the customer, well, they usually they, they are the only ones who who can do a test with the product because they have the the entire system on their end. So if they specify something like we have to meet, we certainly will. Uh, we, we we work on that, and but other than that, that's pretty much all the tests we do there. Okay, so you do a delamination test. It sounds like with the when there is stiffener involved. Kind of, yeah. We 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 make, we kind of you know test that everything is where it's supposed to be, the way it's supposed to be. It was built per per thing, basically the the fabrication driving and everything. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it, putting all of that into one place, I'm I'm sure it can be difficult to manage. But I, it sounds like it's the collaboration is extremely important since you are working uh, with so many other people involved in in one thing. Whereas you know, I think a lot of designers are so used to working with, you know, they just kind of receive the schematics, they do the layout and send it out, or maybe they just have the requirements, they do the schematics, send it out to the layout guy, and then they kind of call it a day. Yeah, they usually do that, actually. <laughs> well, I know I know we try not to do that, and I, I think it's great that you've uh, kind of shown us a good example of what it's uh, like to actually work with, uh, work directly with the manufacturing team, since, I mean, in a way, you are part of the manufacturing team. You're just on the physical design end rather than the actual uh, guy who's running stuff through a process. Yeah, definitely. It's a very good thing to do. It's kind of new for me, but enjoying a lot, you know, learning every day, definitely with these people. Uh, there are things I didn't know before. Um, I mean, it's definitely good to learn something new every day. So how long have you been working at your, your current employer? If you don't mind uh, me asking. I've been there two and a half years, actually. Did, I mean, when you came into that environment, was it different from, from where you were at previously? Uh, some parts, yes, you know, the, the way, I mean, this, every company is different on the, the way they do things, 
But I mean, in this, this is my very first time working with a manufacturing shop right next to me. So it's kind of interesting because, you know, it makes your job easier and challenging at the same time because, you know, when you have an external supplier, well, they want your business. So they try to, I'm going to say, work with you or do pretty much whatever you want. And of course, they're going to charge you, right? But in this case, well, the guy is right next to you. He's going to ask you to change things because he's going to make things easier and better. And I mean, of course, you want to do it. And it's, uh, you know, a different because here's uh, working with the guy, with the guys, the entire team right next to you. So, which is pretty cool. That's, you, you brought up a great point. Yeah, a, a good external supplier will do what they can to make sure that you're going to be successful because they're hoping you come back for that run of 10,000 or 100,000 or however many. Yeah, definitely. I, actually, you know, most of them, of course, all of them actually want your business, you know, and they try to, you know, give you options, work with you, a good supplier, I mean, and make your, you know, your life easier, their life easier. But, you know, again, communication and, and timing, it's important and it's not the same having the guys right next to you than, you know, on the other side of the country or overseas, you never know. Yeah, uh, I know with overseas, it can be difficult sometimes. I've not only uh, tried doing that myself and didn't have a great experience, I also uh, have heard some horror stories from customers who only want to work in the U.S. because they've had such a bad experience or they've gotten just something that was totally defective. And, of course, the overseas supplier is like, well, tough, you know? Yeah, exactly. Or, or, or you know, sending an email and waiting one day to get an answer and, you know, it's uh, losing time there with uh, back and forth emails. So, you know, it's advantage, disadvantage, of course, but you do what what is best for your product, your company. I know all about the sending out the email into the black hole overseas. I'm having to deal with something like that right now, actually, this morning I had to deal with that. Um, that's always fun. Uh, well, I, you know, I really appreciate your perspective and, you know, especially being someone who does the design who, who runs a design firm um i don't have as much visibility as i would like into manufacturing so it's it's always interesting to get that perspective so i definitely want to thank you so much for being here juan and talking with us for the brief time we've had and um i hope to uh see you virtually at altium live this year yeah uh, i hope i can attend definitely so you i guess you're not coming to san diego this time <laughs> well, it's supposed to go all virtual now, so um, unfortunately, oh. yeah, I won't be a... I thought they said it's going to be like in person, too. Uh, they did They did switch it, yeah. They switched it to, to virtual now. So um, now it's nice because everyone can attend. Um, yeah, well, definitely. I'll, I'll see you there then, for sure. All right, cool. <laughs> well, thank you again. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to, to chat more. And um, for anyone who's listening, if you haven't signed up for Altium Live, uh, go check out the link in the show notes uh, and go, go sign up for a virtual conference. And um, we're really excited to have it uh, be virtual this year because um, although I think we would like for it all to be in person, of course, we're going to get a lot more people from all over the world attending. And I think it's going to be a great event. Um, Juan, thank you again so much for, for taking the time to chat with us. And uh, to everyone that's listening, uh, keep on learning and stay on track. 